Which is bigger, a cherry or a golf ball? To answer this question, an image may have popped up in your mind's eye of a cherry, a golf ball and their relative sizes. At least it may have for the average person. But for some, mental imagery can look vastly different from your own. The average person may visualize a pretty decent cherry, perhaps a couple of details missing. Individuals with aphantasia, however, may see a cherry in black or white, perhaps not be able to place its size in relation to a golf ball, or can't visualize a cherry at all. On the other hand, those with hyperphantasia have described mental images as vivid as real seeing. Today, I will be presenting the paper, Congenital Lack and Extraordinary Ability in Object and Spatial Imagery, an investigation on subtypes of aphantasia and hyperphantasia. The beginning of the paper is dedicated to outlining previous research. Referencing a conglomeration of studies, the paper distinguishes between two forms of mental imagery based upon the two visual brain pathways. The first is the ventral pathway, which processes the properties of objects like colour and shape. The second is the dorsal pathway, which processes spatial attributes such as size and location. Hence, the same object versus space distinction is hypothesised to translate into mental images as well. The paper includes findings from recent studies that support this hypothesis, yet identifies three open questions that had yet been unanswered. Firstly, can the subtypes of aphantasia and hyperphantasia, spatial or object, be identified? Secondly, do individuals with aphantasia have a different experience of involuntary imagery than the average person? And thirdly, does a lack of spatial and object imagery affect other cognitive skills? These can include retrospective and prospective memory to sense of direction or facial recognition. To address these queries, the authors collected and analysed data from a sample of 490 healthy participants. To begin, the participants were asked to complete an object and spatial imagery questionnaire consisting of 30 rating style questions that were used to identify the variety of mental imagery abilities. They were able to successfully identify 15 people with object aphantasia, 17 with spatial aphantasia, 8 participants with object hyperphantasia and 14 with spatial hyperphantasia. Following this identification step, Participants were then asked to complete a number of follow-up questionnaires to gauge skill levels of different cognitive tasks, including generating a mental image of a single event or object, rotating and manipulating imaginary objects in space, the vividness and clarity of a mental image, involuntary imagery, retrospective and prospective memory, facial recognition, sense of direction and environment. It was hypothesised that those with object aphantasia or hyperphantasia would have enhanced or altered abilities for object visualisation respectively. Also, they would report a high slash low vividness in comparison to the controls, i.e. those with average imagining abilities. Conversely, those with spatial hyperphantasia or aphantasia would not report any differences from controls in those two categories but instead have enhanced or limited abilities to rotate objects in their mind and may perform highly slash lowly respectively in their navigational skills. The authors had no strong hypothesis regarding the effect upon involuntary imagery due to mixed results in previous studies and expected to see some unmentioned differences in the other two cognitive skills. The results collected were partly in line with the hypotheses. Object aphantasia and hyperphantasia did indeed lessen and enhance visualisation of single objects and events in comparison to controls and more so than those with spatial imagery abnormalities. Likewise, those with spatial aphantasia had worse self-reported abilities of spatial visualisation and those with spatial hyperphantasia better abilities than controls. Vividness was significantly decreased for those with object aphantasia and mildly increased for those with object hyperphantasia. Although participants with aphantasia did report significantly lower navigational skills in comparison to controls, 
no significant differences or trends were found in the ability of any participant to experience involuntary imagery, recognize faces, nor regarding retrospective and prospective memory. This study sought to investigate a possible distinction between object and spatial imagery skills in the visualization extremities, as well as the implication of these abnormalities on a variety of cognitive skills. To this end, the results certainly proved that spatial and object imagery resulted in differing abilities for imagining, both in relation to controls and each other. Involuntary mental imagery, however, was shown to be completely unaffected by one's ability to purposefully imagine. This leads to questions around the neural mechanisms underpinning involuntary versus voluntary visualisation, an area the authors encourage more research to be done upon in the future. Another area in which this study has had an impact was regarding memory. Though the authors found no discrepancies between participant groups in retrospective and prospective memory, they allude to those with aphantasia using verbal strategies or memory aids to bypass their mental imagery difficulties, thus calling on future studies to investigate this further. The authors leave having made a preliminary and fascinating impact upon their research queries into the subtypes and implications of aphantasia and hyperphantasia and provide appropriate next steps for those interested in this field of research. Thank you for listening.